Let's jump into the series tonight. You've got help. And we're talking about still receiving the promise. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll get going. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for every individual that's here, every family that's represented. Thank you, Father, that many people have come from work and, and they're tired and weary and dealing with stuff. But Lord, I thank you. I ask that you would just rejuvenate them tonight and strengthen them tonight. And that they leave here stronger than actually how they came in, not more tired, less tired. Father, I just pray our hearts are open, our ears are open. Show us wonderful things from your word because we don't know everything and we're always learning, always growing, always moving forward. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Recapping last week, we begin to talk about uh, God always offers choices. I won't go through the whole thing, but God always offers choices. He never forces anybody. And so that's always a good thing to keep in mind. God, he just, he says, whosoever will. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and not, not busting down the door. If you open the door, he comes in. So we talked about that. We talked about our role as believers is to encourage, not to discourage those who are around us that want to pursue God. And I can't emphasize that enough. I think we do a good job of that here at, at the ark. You know, someone asked me the other day, what kind of church are we? I told him, I said, let me just, if we could stay away from labels. Because as soon as you label something, you separate some and identify with others. I said, we're a life-giving church. We love God. We love people. Amen. How's that? So that means we're broad enough to, to be open to people who come from all kinds of backgrounds. And I like that. Not everybody has to come from the same background. Not everyone has to think alike. But I always, we, we've said it for a long time. If what I teach goes against what you maybe heard all your life, I recognize that can be a little uncomfortable. And sometimes it can be a little awkward. You're like, that's not what I've been taught. And I always encourage you to do this. Always keep an open mind to scriptures. One of the reasons I'm giving scriptures is because a lot of people, especially when it comes to this area on the Holy Spirit, a lot of people have been taught a lot of things that there aren't a lot of scriptural background for it. But yet because they've been taught that by people they love and respect, oftentimes they'll put the brakes on. And sometimes you can just sense the brakes going on. I always say, don't. Don't, don't worry. If I give you scriptures, no one's going to force anything on you. You make up your own mind. But you want scriptures for it. Not because your Aunt Bertha, who is the greatest Christian who ever walked the face of the earth, told you something and you hung on to it like, but Aunt Bertha said it's the truth. And so a lot of you have had, come from different backgrounds. Maybe we're a different kind of church. Maybe you came in here, somebody was raising their hands. You're like, I don't know about that. They're raising their hands. Well, as long as our hands aren't in your pocket, you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it, these are, and people, people come from different traditions. Some of you who come from Catholic and Lutheran backgrounds, I know we freaked you out when you came in here. <laughs> if, if you came from a Presbyterian background, you probably heard more noise around you in one service than you heard the entire time you went to a Presbyterian church. I, I understand that. So, but the idea is you always want to keep open to scriptures and that's why we, that's why I actually I have been taking time and simply going scripture by scripture. And I realize sometimes I like, well, I've not got needs, I don't know. No, you want a scriptural basis for what you believe. There's a lot of bad news out there. There's a lot of fake news out there. We need truth. And truth is not necessarily what Alan believes. Truth is what do the scriptures say? That's how you stay. Listen, that's how you keep from being messed up. That's how you keep from getting off. That's how you keep from being deceived. That you keep an humble heart and say, I'm going to stay with the scriptures. So we begin to talk last week about Jesus instructing the disciples to wait for the promise. I'm going to read that verse again. I, didn't, I did not ask Harry to put it in his notes I'm, I'm going to read it again because I think it's just such a powerful scripture. It's in Acts, the first chapter. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He said, and being assembled together with him, verse four, Acts one, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is talking. Now he's talking to people. He said, I want you to wait for the promise. Now here's my question to you. Are these people already born again? 
Again, not a trick question, but it's a good one. I'm going to, I'm going to subscribe to you. Yes. Jesus has been raised from the dead. They have realized he is Lord and Christ. And how do you know, Thomas, Thomas, when he saw him said, my Lord and my God. And see, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So these guys are believers. They believe Jesus is raised from the dead. They received him. But Jesus said, I need you to stay here until you receive the promise. Well, well, the promise of what? The promise of being born again? No, they were already born again. He said the promise they were to receive was the promise, he said, that you've already heard about me. He said, John baptized with water. To baptize means to immerse. John the Baptist, that's where he got his name. He was not the first Southern Baptist. He was a Baptist because he baptized people. To baptize means to fully immerse. I realize some of you are sprinkled. You're like, well, I got, I got sprinkled. It's okay. All of it is outside. It's being, by the way, baptism will not save you. Baptism is a sign that you have been saved. So it's, it's a, it, it, ba, listen, because it's like, if you're not baptized the way our church believes it, you're not saved. Just look at them and smile at them and go, bless your heart. That's just, <laughs> bless your heart. That's, that's crazy. If we believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and we confess with our mouth that God has raised him. No, if we believe in in our, in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, we, we shall be saved. That, that's how we got saved. Baptism then is a sign. But now he's talking about something else. He said, John baptized, he immersed with water. He said, you're going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he's talking to born again people. He's saying, this is something else that's going to happen. So he's talking about a secondary event. This is where people get kind of confused. They're like, no, no, Alan, I got the Holy Spirit when I, was, when, when I was born again. I got the Holy Spirit. My answer to you is absolutely, yes, you did. In fact, you were born of the Spirit. Jesus talked about being born of the Spirit and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit and he indwells you. You got, what we're talking about is a different dimension of him. Same Holy Spirit, different dimension. So let me just continue to lay that out. Jesus laid that, he talked about the promise. Now, we also talked about they sent the, they went down to the Samaritans, which was a surprise to them. Philip preached the Samaritans and they all got saved. And they sent Peter and John down them who laid hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit. Again, a secondary event. Here's, the, here's another one as we talk about this. As, as I was going through this, here's one of the things that kept continuing to come to me. The early church treated the Holy Spirit as really valuable. They, they really were enamored with the idea that they could receive this promise from God and that the Holy Spirit would come into their lives. They know Jesus was gone. They know this was his promise. And to the, whole, and to the early church, they treated it as valuable. There's, there's some importance in that. I, I think with anything that you see that God has done, maybe he's done something in your life or something, we always want to treat it as valuable. Never devalue what the Lord has done. That's right. I say, well, you know what? We ought, we ought to thank God. Well, I don't have anything to thank God about. Time. Time, Sparky. We'll, let's, let's back that up. You don't have anything to thank God about? No, my, my life is messed up. Have you been saved? Are you born again? Does, does, are you a child of God? Well, yeah. Then we have something to be grateful for. Every day of the year. And the idea is the, the, the enemy, the enemy is a devaluer. He will always try to devalue. Well, you didn't get anything. Well, you're not anything. He, he's always, you ever notice the enemy is always trying to tear us down. Words that tear us down, words that devalue, devalue what God's doing, devalue scripture, devalue church, devalue everything of God. Why? Because when you value something and you treat it as valuable, it takes on a heightened importance in your life and it makes a difference. So when when the early church is talking, Peter talked about it, said, in fact, in Acts, the second chapter on, on the day of Pentecost, had all these people that gathered and they're watching these guys. They spilled out in the street and they're, and they're, and they're speaking in tongues. And everyone, someone said, they're drunk. And Peter said, nope. They said, they are not drunk. He said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And they recognized that. And then Peter stands up in Acts 2. Go ahead and put that up, guys. Then Peter said to them, 
Repent, because I asked him, okay, what do we do? Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Which sounds like two different events. I'm gonna receive Jesus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna for the forgiveness of my sins, and then I'm, I'm gonna receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they value this gift, and we should value this gift as well, because he is valuable. I, don't, don't, don't ever find yourself mocking anything God's doing. Even if you don't understand it, you want to take a respectful place towards it. There are things, I, listen, there are people and, and, and pastors and preachers I don't agree with at all. I was talking to a young man uh, recently and we, we were interviewing for a position and he asked me, he said, I'm in this camp. And he listed a certain preacher. Well, this guy and I are on by two ends of the spectrum. And I just, I just told this young man, I said, I said, no, I said, you wouldn't be happy here. I said, because I, I, I preach something very different from that. And uh, he said, well, he said, well, what, what is it about this pastor you don't like? And I, I caught myself. This is a young guy. I just caught myself. I said, listen, I said, this man, I named him. I said, he's a man of God. He's doing a good job. He and I don't agree on a lot of things. I said, but I don't want to detract anything from him and I'm not going to debate with you. We're on two different ends. Guys, can we get to the place where we recognize that the enemy are not our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't agree with us? That, that the enemy is the one who tries to do everything he can to divide the body of Christ? If you don't agree with what we believe in, that's okay. Whether you like it or not, we're going to love you anyway. Amen. We're going to believe the best about you anyway. But don't get, don't get, Joy hates me for saying this. And I won't say it because I will get in so much trouble. I will get in so much trouble when I get home. I'm just not even, I'm just going to move on down. Thank you, Lord. For, for arresting me. Discretion, the better part of valor right there. The, uh, we see the Holy Spirit helping the Gentiles. Uh, Peter, Peter, keeping in mind that when I say Gentiles, if you're not familiar with that term, Gentiles is anyone that does not have a Jewish background or heritage. Most of you, how many of you have absolutely no Jewish in you whatsoever? You'd be considered Gentile. Not me. <laughs> I'm a Samaritan. I'm half Jewish. And so, uh, but Gentiles are those who have no Jewish heritage. The early church did not believe that Gentiles could be saved. Now, aren't you glad they got a different revelation? And God had to use Peter to get a hold of that. How many of you know that you can be taught something and be taught something, and it, sometimes God has to bust us out of our box? And here was Peter, and Peter didn't think any, any, anybody but Jews could be saved. And the Lord gave him a vision. He was getting ready to eat. The Lord gave him a vision of a sheep coming up and down. He said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, no. He said, no, Lord. This is in the vision. He said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. I've only eaten kosher all my life. No jack-in-the-box barbecue. No, no, Lord. And, and the Lord said in the vision, what I've cleansed, don't you call common. And Peter's like, what's that mean? And he, he goes downstairs and, and, the, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, there are three men waiting for you. He said, go with them. Don't doubt anything. So Peter came downstairs, showed up. Here's three dudes going, Peter, I need you to come with us. So Peter comes, steps into the middle of a, of a Bible study full of Gentiles. Got a Roman centurion and all his buddies. And Peter steps in. He's like, uh-oh. I'm in, I'm in the deep tapioca now because now I am... I am talking to all these Gentiles and, the, and from my background, it's unlawful for me to even go into a Gentile's house. That's how the Jews separated. And so Peter said, okay, I'm here. What do you want? And, and Cornelius was a Roman centurion who was praying. He said, an angel appeared to me and said to send to Joppa for you that you would tell me words whereby we could be saved. And we're here, we're listening. And Peter began to speak. And this is what happened in Acts, the 10th chapter. We are, Peter speaking, he says, we are witnesses of all things which he, talking about Jesus, did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. 
Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That word remission means forgiveness. Aren't you glad that applies to us? Yes. Whoever believes in his name, aren't you glad that anybody can walk through our doors tonight and they can say, you know what? I have a Muslim background. We say, I don't care what your background is. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and God raised him from the dead, you can be saved tonight. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter who your grandma is. Does not matter where you come from. Here's the truth. That's, that's the truth. So Peter preaches that. That's classic salvation message. Jesus died. He was crucified. God raised him from the dead. You believe in him and you're safe. Aren't you glad we didn't have to work for it? Didn't have to earn it. We just receive what he's done for us. Hallelujah. Well, well these, so these Gentiles heard this. They're listening. And what shocked them was what happened next because it really messed with their mind. Let me see if I've even got it. Carrie, I don't think I have this. I don't even have this with them. Time out. Justin, you want to give me a musical interlude here? Just for... right. Carrie, I'm going to, if you could, if you're back there, would you put this up and it's Acts 10, 44 through 48. If you've got that, Acts 10, and I'll give you just a little time to put that up there. Peter just preached remission of sins. Thank you. Carrie's quick. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, Peter had about six guys who went with him who were Jewish. Of the circumcision, he's talking about people who have a Jewish background. Of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and they asked him to stay a few days. You notice it said they were astonished. So here these, here these Jewish guys are, they're listening to Peter talk and he tells them about Jesus. And then, and I think this is probably, thank God for the wisdom of God. Because all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit falls on these folks and the same thing that happened uh, on the day of Pentecost happened right there. And these people begin to speak in tongues and magnify God. Now, I'm going to talk about this next week in depth. But I'm going to talk about what trips most people up. And what trips most people up is tongues. Speak, there's like, I've heard people, in fact, someone asked me a great question last week. I said, Alan, so, uh, uh, can you, can you give me more direction about, about the Holy Spirit? And, and so she said, should I just read the book of Acts? I said, yeah, good. Look, do that. Look that up. She said this, and this is a question a lot of people ask. She said, do I have to speak with tongues? Now, if you're Baptist, you're thinking, no. <laughs> no. No. Now, here's what, here's, what, here's what police don't do. Police don't say that tongues is of the devil because we don't have any scripture for that. And you would just have said that what Peter and James and John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was up there on the, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke with tongues. So let's, let's back off that. This is of the devil. But this is where people kind of get up and they're like, uh, you know, I want the Holy Spirit, but I don't want the tongues. I'll talk about this next week. It's like my pastor used to say, it's like buying a pair of shoes. The tongues come with it. But, but, listen, but listen to me. This is where, and I understand, listen, and everyone has got some crazy charismatic or Pentecostal that they've known in their past life. And they're like, Bus, these people are crazy. And I don't want to be crazy. Because I know that if I get filled with the Spirit, I'm just going to be in a business meeting one day and all of a sudden he's going to come on me and I'm going to be speaking in tongues in the middle of a business meeting and get fired. <laughs> or I'm going to be at a family reunion 
at the wedding and they're just about to say I do and the Holy Spirit's going to come on me and then the, I'm going to bust out right in the middle of the wedding and just do some Pentecostal fall down dance and speak in tongues. <laughs> Let me relieve your mind. Let me help you. I've been filled with the Spirit for 30, excuse me, 40 years. I pray in tongues every day. But you've never heard me come in and go, I feel it coming on. I'll talk about this next week. But this, if this is what's hung you up, I want you to stay with me. Come back next week. Because I want to talk about why that the ability to pray in the Spirit has been one of the most, the most valuable things that's ever happened to me in my Christian life. And I can say that also for my wife. And by the way, if you, that's how this church got started. No, I was praying in the spirit and Conroe dropped in my heart. If you'll notice, there are no boxes with snakes. If you'll notice, there's nothing weird. And this is what I'm going to keep saying. The Holy Spirit won't make you weird. He will make you strong. He is not here to be weird. He's the spirit of a sound mind. So if you've been thinking, and listen, I did business. I, I did sales for a number of years. I did all business meetings. I never lost control in a business meeting. Paul said, I will pray in, with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Paul said, I will. It's up to us. Listen, guys, God isn't going to make you do anything. So it's, but what, it, what you find and what I told this lady, when she asked me the question, she, she said, do I have to? I said, no, no, darling, you get to. And the get to is such a blessing and such a help. And I'll talk about that more next week. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to, I want to just put your mind, now, now listen, if you go, Alan, I, I like you, but I don't want you of this. You don't need to worry about it. It will not jump on you. You'll not come next week and all of a sudden, you're like, Lord, I didn't want this. So he is, he, he, he's not going to force you to do anything. But here's the good news. If you want to receive, you can. And we'll pray for people and, and we'll, we'll pray. It's not crazy. We'll have a, have a quiet time. We'll ask, we'll ask everyone who wants to receive, stay. The ones who don't, slip out. And no one's checking you at the door going, no, they're not coming. Listen, guys. The bottom line is we love people and we love God and we want to help people receive Jesus. Now that's the one we'll go to the mat on. Whether you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is totally up to you. I want to sell you on next week on why it is really good in your life and why I'll help you. If you have kids, anybody got kids? Oh Lord, you need the Holy Spirit in your life in a, in a, in a big way. You, you, you need his help. And here's, here's the, the big picture thought. We keep thinking of the Holy Spirit as an experience. Jesus kept talking to a church that had a mission and the mission was to reach the world. The reason we want to more of, of, of the Spirit of God in our life is not so we can say we had an experience or look down our nose on anybody else. The reason we want the Holy Spirit, we want, I want more of God in my life so I can be more effective in reaching a lost world. I want, I want more of God in my life so I can be a better witness in my family and in my neighborhood of who Jesus is. I want more of God in my life because if, if I can get more of him, I want more of him. Because I've seen all of Alan I want. I want more of him in my life and less of me. And so if I can, if I can have the same gift that Paul, Peter, Mary, and James and John and the early church, if I can have that, I'm a candidate. I, that's something I, I'm like, please help me help Lord, because I need help. I need help pastoring this church. I'm glad I've got help. It's a big church. There's a lot of stuff going on, but you know what? He's bigger than all of that. And he helps us. We got prayer. We got prayer teams that meet and they pray for hours for you. You can't pray for hours without the Holy Spirit's help. Because you get past God bless pastor and God bless joy and Justin, the music team and all the volunteers. And what do I pray now? <laughs> God bless 
and you can get stuck, but I can tell you I can get unstuck and how you can absolutely help your prayer line. It's been a blessing. We love you. I want to, do, I want to, see, I want to see you enjoy all of God's best for your life. That, man, that's, my, that's my role as, as a pastor. You don't want this? Fine. But man, if I could talk you into it, I will. I'll do everything I can because it's been such a blessing to me and a blessing to Joy and a blessing to our family. i never forget one time a, a lady, she came from a Baptist background and she, she looked at me and she, she was in my office and we were talking about the Holy Spirit and she said, well, I, I figured Joy was filled with the Spirit. <laughs> she said, but you? <laughs> I said, yeah, even me. Even me.